in the future. It didn't work. <laughs> Number 231, let's stand and sing the first and last. Jesus say, 231. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 12. We're just going to read that one verse together. Joel 2, verse 12. Therefore, also now, church and 
and uh, we just been to a nice concert and I was not drunk and so he was very nice and <laughs> he said, oh, Papa John's is just over there, sorry to hold you up, have a nice day. <laughs> Fortunately, I had the correct insurance and in my vehicle and everything, everything was good. <laughs> so that was probably the interesting, trying to find a large 999 pizza. So, but God isn't always just going to scream at us, is it? He's going to try to gently, we go off track sometimes, we all do. Everybody in here does, even when you're a Christian. But God is, I'm not trying to com compare the Lord to Google, but God is going to try his best to gently nudge us back onto the right track. Uh, sometimes he may have to yell at us, but um, thanks God we have him to gently get us back to on the direction we need to go. We need to always pray that he'll do that for us. Let's stand and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Everybody hear me fine? Craig? All right, so before we get started, let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to uh, get the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another uh, Lord's Day. Thank you for all the people that came out today. Lord, I pray for those who weren't able to make it out today. Lord, I pray for the lost. They will come to know Jesus today if they're here before it's too late. Lord, I ask that you give me the words that you need me to say and lead and guide me in, in this lesson and clear understanding and uh, speaking in clear words that everyone out there will understand and, and learn the truth. Uh, Lord, we have many means, needs here at this church. I ask that you uh, meet those to, to your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so we are uh, in still in 1 Samuel, so if you wouldn't mind getting out your Bibles. to 1 Samuel, and we're in chapter number 13.
All right, so where we left off, where uh, Dave left off in chapter 12 is Samuel speaking to uh, the children of Israel and, and to Saul and, and really kind of uh, explaining to them, you know, once Saul kind of, you know, they asked for a king. Okay? They had rejected God, they had rejected God's authority, and they wanted an earthly king, much like all the other civilizations, all the other places around. They wanted an earthly king. So um, the Lord said, you know, heed to those people, listen to them. And so... Samuel's telling the people, this is what you asked for, and he goes through chapter 12 and explains uh, the situation and, and what, what's going to happen. And so we're up to 13, and we're starting with Saul has now been king. Skips over the first year pretty quickly. It says Saul reigned one year, and we had reigned two years over Israel, and that's when we start here. Uh, and this is really when Saul really starts to, you know, as a kid, when I heard of Saul, you know, I always had those picture Bibles, and Saul was like this awful guy that was like trying to kill David. I mean, it's like Satan and Saul were like, you know, right there together. In my eyes as a kid, okay? And he was one of those, like, he's like Nebuchadnezzar. He's just this horrible person. And as I read more, okay, he's, you know, he's like us, okay? As you read these things, he does a lot of the same things we do, okay? Um, so, you know, I, you know, I see a lot of the things I do. Um, it's, it's him, and as far as looking at him, and it really kind of humbles you when you look at, at who Saul was. And he was a godly man. I mean, it mentions it early on, but he made a lot of bad decisions. He made a lot of bad decisions for choosing to go his way instead of the Lord's way. And so that's what the, the theme of this lesson is going to be, is about obedience. And, you know, it kind of made me start thinking uh, about Saul. And, you know, many of the, as we, as we talk about this, a lot of the things that Saul did, he was partially obedient. You thought, what do you all think about partial obedience? Is it better than zero obedience? It's the same. It's okay. You know, that's what I started thinking um, as we read along. Continue to think of that because a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good. I'm following most of what I need to do, and I'm in the same boat. Okay. Well, the Lord wants me to do this. He wants me to do X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to do X, Y, and half a Z. You know, that's the card I don't really like. So you know, God, He'll be okay. I've got two out of three. You know, that's pretty good odds. That's a super majority. That's, you know, that'll work. That, not necessarily. Right. Right? Not at all. Um, think about your kids. And I have to deal with this with my children all the time. And people are around your kids and my kids, and hopefully yours aren't like this. But And you say, okay, go brush your teeth, put your clothes on, put your shoes on, and get in the vehicle. Okay? We're going to go somewhere. Okay? So if they follow two out of four or three out of four of those things, is that obedience? No. Are you going to get done what you need to get done? Now I'm going. To, we're going somewhere, okay? If they put their shoes on, brush their teeth, and get dressed, but they forget to get in the vehicle, <laughs> we're not going anywhere, okay? If they forget to put their shoes on when we stop at the first uh, restaurant, hmm, that's not going to work, okay? If they get to brush their teeth, teeth are going to rot out. You know, we got a lot of issues with that. So three out of four is not good, and it's going to work the same here with with Saul. It works the same with us. So just keep that in mind, the whole idea of partial obedience, which Andrew said, is, you know, it's, it's sin. It's still the same thing. We'll get to that at the end a little bit more. Uh, but we're in chapter 13, and I'm going to hit some of the high points on this because there's quite a bit um, to cover in this. But the whole general theme is, is obedience or the lack of obedience. So I'll start reading a little bit in here. So we'll start in verse number one of chapter 13. Um, you know what? Before I do that, let's, uh, let's do our key verse. And we'll do that. Okay, the key verse is 1 Samuel 15, 22. I jumped the gun a little bit. So 1 Samuel 15, 22. That'll be kind of our, that's kind of like the, the culminating more verse, the theme of the whole thing. So would you please stand? Uh, 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as it obeyed the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of the rams. Of rams. You may be seated. See, it's, they, they taught me something. <laughs> Learn something new every day. Okay, so let's go back to chapter number 13. Okay, so we're in verse number 1. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose in 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash and Mount Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan, this is his son, in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his 
to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of Philistines, and that Israel also was had an uh, abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. And you'll see this theme. I'm going to come back um, to verse number 5. But, you know, Saul, and it mentions it even in the scripture, Saul was dealing with, Saul was dealing with enemies. He was fighting his entire reign as king. Okay? And I, you know, I don't think that's coincidence um, that, that he was having to deal with. There was one group after the other. I mean, he was constantly having to fight against different groups of people. And you see, you know, other leaders didn't necessarily have that same, um, have to deal with the same consequences. Some of them had peace for many, many years with the different groups. And a lot of it depends on their choices. Most of it, all of it depends on their choices and how well they chose to follow God or follow their own path. All right, so we're back in verse number five. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And the people as the sand, which was in the seashore in multitude, and they came up and pitched in Michmash. Sorry, I'm going to butcher that word every time. <laughs> Eastward from uh, Beth Bethlehem. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, and the people did hide themselves in caves, in thickets, in rocks, and in high places, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead, as for Saul, he was yet in, in Gilgad, and all the people followed him trembling. Right. Why are they trembling? Why are they scared? Anybody notice that? What's the reason? Think they're going to lose? Have any, is there any faith going on there as far as trusting in? Who are they trusting in? Saul. Saul. Size of the army. You know, you can look at that and say, oh, okay, it's what, 3,000 versus uh, 6,000? Well, that's not very good odds for the children of Israel. Um, so we're in verse number 8. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to, to Gilgad, and the people were scattered from him. Okay, so let's focus on this a little bit. Um, so why does he go to Gilgad? So let's go to go back to 1 Samuel 10. Uh, we're in, go back to chapter 10. So Dave uh, mentioned this a couple Sundays ago when he was covering this. So, um, so Saul being anointed king here, uh, and Samuel is and he's giving instructions to Saul. And so we're in chapter 10, verse number 8. All right, so we're going back a little bit in time. And it says, And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee, and show thee what thou shalt do. Okay, so there's the instruction. Here's what Saul's saying. You know, Saul is speaking the words of the Lord. We, we talked about that earlier. Saul became a prophet and mentioned that his, you know, I think one of the things said his words would never fall to the ground. So he's basically, whatever the Lord's, whatever he says is going to happen, this is the word of the Lord. Okay, so let's go back to chapter number 13. So he tells him, go there, wait seven days, I'll come, I'll do a, a burnt offering, I'll do it. And he didn't mention anything else. Okay, that's what he mentioned. Okay, so let's go on down. Um, we're in verse number nine. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Wait, did it say anything in there about Saul going and Samuel doesn't show up on time? Hmm, nope, I didn't see that part. Okay, think about this partial obedience. Okay, and number, verse number 10, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made the end of the offering, the burnt, off, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and we might salute him. Okay, so he could not wait. He was there for seven days. He went to where he was supposed to go. He stayed a certain amount of time. Remember, he did one thing right. He did another thing right. But that last one, Samuel said, I will do it. I will offer the burnt offering, and then I will instruct you as to what, from the Lord, what you should do next. So Saul couldn't wait. Remember, he's thinking more about what his will and what he wants to do than what the Lord wants him to do. So we're in verse number 11. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore I said, The Philistines will come down now upon the meat to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. So here's the excuses. Okay? Blaming it on the, blaming it on the people. He's blaming it on the Philistines. He's pretty much blaming it on Samuel. He says here, um, 
uh, that thou camest not within the days appointed. So you told me you were going to be here, didn't show up, so I went ahead and did it myself. Okay, that's a lot of times how we are. You know, people are supposed to be waiting on somebody to do something, they don't come, so you just go do it yourself. Okay, in a lot of situations, okay, but in this situation, you know, when the Lord tells you to do something, probably a pretty good idea to do it. So there's there's a first example right there of um, of disobedience or partial obedience, which is in the Lord's eyes is the same thing. Um, so verse number 13, and Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord, of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now will the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Okay, so he is starting to drift in the wrong direction. Uh, do me a favor and go to Proverbs. And this one mentions it in the Sunday School book. And that's, um, I think it's a good verse. Proverbs chapter number 12. Let me save my place here. Chapter number 12, verse number 15. Would anybody like to volunteer to read that? Anybody give me a volunteer here? You want me to, hey, Craig, you always come through for me. All right, so chapter 12, verse number 15. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkens unto the counsel is wise. Okay. You think that describes uh, Saul? Mm -hmm. the, the first part? Yep. yep. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkens unto counsel is wise. Okay. So in the council in this example would have been God and Samuel. Samuel told him what to do. He didn't do it. Okay, you can go back to Sam, uh, the first Samuel chapter 13. But yeah, that applies to us as well. Exactly to us as far as you know, doing right in our own eyes is never going to lead us in the right direction. Okay, it's never going to lead us to, to God's will. And it happened here for, for Saul. Uh, let's see. So they end up going up against the Philistines in battle. And there's a lot of things here we can dig into. And the Philistines, I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, verse number 19, the Philistines had basically taken over the whole industry of, like a, of a blacksmith. And I don't know necessarily how this worked. Verse 19 says, there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. Uh, lest the Hebrews make them swords or, uh, or spears. So you know, the, Israel, the Israelites couldn't even make their own weapons. They didn't have any. Uh, the Philistines had basically taken over that industry. So now they're, they're outnumbered. Um, let's go to... See where we're at. I'm losing my place a little bit here. Um, all right, so let's go to chapter number fourteen. So we're still they still haven't uh, went to battle yet. The, um, the the Philistines and the children of Israel are in another an, another conflict here going on, and we're seeing a very very poor leadership out of Saul. And then it comes in Jonathan. Uh, and Jonathan is you know, it's kind of the opposite. You don't hear a lot about him here early, but you do see that he goes in a different path than what his father does. And you're gonna, we're going to get to, I'm sure we'll get to Jonathan more when we start talking more about David and how, you know, how he defended David and looked out for David. And they had a very, very close friendship. Uh, but in this, we see that he's in control of a certain group of people. Uh, let's start with verse number 1 in chapter number 14. Now, it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man, that bear his armor. Come and let us go over to the Philistine garrison. So this is a group of Philistines that are gathered somewhere. And that is on the other side. But he told not his father. I wonder why he didn't tell his father. Anybody have a clue to that? I kind of thought of that. I wonder why he tried to keep it from him. Probably wouldn't agree with him. Yep. What's that? Same thing. Same thing. Yep. He probably would have. Because he's thinking militarily. Why are you going over there? You're going to lose. You're outnumbered. Okay. Um, he probably knew what his father's heart also and what his father would have done. Um, so then Saul stays behind. Okay. So let's skip ahead to Jonathan and his, uh, I guess they call it his uh, armor bearer. So uh, kind of like a servant that's with him to, um, to, to help him protect him. Let's go to verse number uh, six. This is a good verse. So this is what John, this is Jonathan's view. Okay, you don't typically hear Saul say this too often, his, his father. Uh, verse number 6 of chapter number 14. He says, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. He's talking about the Philistines. It may be there, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord, to save by many or by few. So he's saying there that nothing is impossible with the Lord here. He's either going to defeat the Philistines with a lot, or it might just be us. It might just be me and you. And look what his, his armor bearer said. 
He didn't say, whoa, you're crazy, man. Okay, he could see that genuine faith, that genuine belief that Jonathan had, and he says, do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. Okay, so Jonathan's kind of, his faith kind of uh, is, is very visible from the outside according to this person. So they go over, they basically say that the Lord, uh, long story short, they're looking for a sign here. If the Lord wants us to do this, he'll provide us with, um, with a sign. Um, if, they, if they say thus unto us, we're in verse number nine, tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. Okay? But if they say this, come up unto us and we will go up for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand. And this shall be the sign. Okay? So they go, they go in, these two guys. Now it mentioned in here, and I didn't write down exactly how many there were in there, um, but it's definitely more than two that they're going up against here. They're definitely outnumbered. Okay? This isn't a, a, going to be a route on the side of the, the uh, children of Israel, especially for Jonathan and them. It's just two of them. Verse number 11, and both of them discovered themselves into the garrison of the Philistines. That basically means, hey, okay, we're here. <laughs> It's not even like they were like doing like a sneak attack, like going in behind stuff and like a sniper. These were like, hey, here we are. Okay, they knew what they had. They knew the support that they had on their side. It was a lot more than, a um, lot greater than what the Philistines could have. And the Philistines said, behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. The men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you a thing. <laughs> a little trash to them there. Okay, I hang around with a lot of high school students, and that's that's pretty common, you know. Come here, you want to talk to me? I'll show you something you can talk about. Okay, that's what, that's what they said right there. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, "Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel." Okay, so that was their sign they were looking for. They were asking, "Lord, is this what we should do?" All right, so they go in. It says Jonathan climbed upon his hands, upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. His armor bearer slew after him. And after and that first slaughter which Jonathan his armorer made was about twenty men, with that within as it were a half acre of land. So this is a pretty small little area they're fighting in. Um, two versus at least twenty here. I'd say it probably was twenty. I can't imagine there was one that just kind of like ran away or or survived the whole thing. If it was the Lord's will for that to happen, they were all going to die. Um, so there was trembling in the hosts and in the field and among the people, the garrison, the spoilers. They they also trembled and the earth quaked. Um, you think that was from the Lord? There was just coincidence? I don't think so. Okay, I think that was um, clearly of the Lord there. All right, so we go back to Saul, and, and Saul's wondering where. Um, it says, Saul unto the people, we're in verse 17. Number now to see who's gone from us. So he doesn't realize Jonathan's gone. He doesn't realize he's, he's run away. And um, let's go down to verse number, let's see where I'm at here. Go to verse number 19. Uh, and it came to pass while Saul talked unto the priests that the noise that was the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priests, Withdraw thine hand. And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves. And they came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow. And there was very great discomfiture. Okay? So I'm assuming that's kind of like discomfort or confusion. So it, from Saul's end, you got all these men that are fighting. And now they're, they don't know what's going on. Okay? They're confused. They're, it says there, every man's sword was against his fellow. So now there's like, um, there's strife going on within the group. Um, so Saul's leadership here was very lacking also. Um, you got these two men, Jonathan, with the faith of the Lord. Jonathan and his armor bearer, they go in and slaughter 20 of them. Um, but they're still scared. The rest of them are scared. They don't realize the type of power they had. The verse number 21, moreover the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, which went up, uh, with them in the camp from the country round about. Even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel, which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they had heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Philistines are out, they're running, they're scared, they know that what happened. They saw with their eyes with the, the, the power of the Lord. So the Lord saved Israel that day. It doesn't say Saul. We know that wasn't Saul that did that. The people may have thought it was Saul, but... Definitely in the eyes of the Lord, um, the people that knew that was the Lord. Uh, and the battle passed over unto Beth Haven. Okay. Um, so now Saul wins. The, the, the victory is the, the, for the Israelites. And so he basically says, Don't, nobody eat. Okay. Nobody eat anything. Okay. Um, until the evening. And you know, these men have been in battle. They've been hiding in a cave. They probably didn't have a lot of food they'd been snacking on while they were in there. I can't imagine there'd been much food. They're starving. And he says, don't eat. Okay. This is what I want you to do. All right. 
Uh, he says, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, so that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. He didn't say, we're going to honor the Lord here. It's because it's of me. Okay? Um, this is a, um, this, there's nowhere here that I can find that this is something that the Lord instructed Saul to do. He just told his men, no, don't eat. This is something I want you to do. Avenge my enemies. We're not going to eat anything. Okay? And there's honey. Okay? You ever heard of honey? You know, is there any reference anywhere else in the Bible as far as the land of honey? You ever heard that phrase? All right, well, let's look then. Uh, let's go to Exodus uh, chapter 3. That looks just a little bit interesting. Uh, Exodus 3 and verse number 8. So we're going way back to in Moses. And Moses uh, is getting instruction from the Lord about where he's going to lead him. Um, so Exodus 3, verse number 8. So this is, uh, this is the Lord speaking. Let's go back to verse 7 so we can get the context here, what we're talking about. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. So we're going back to when captivity in Egypt. And they have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Okay? So this is the land we're referring to here. Go back to Samuel now if you want. Okay? So this is the land that the Lord had prepared for the, Israel, the, people, the children of Israel and Saul said, nope, nope, we don't want to take no part of this. Okay? Jonathan didn't know he said it. He hadn't heard it. He probably tuned his dad out a long time ago. Okay? Just like every, sometimes sons do. Tuned his didn't hear. Didn't hear what was going on. Remember, he was out doing um, faithful things for the Lord. And so he eats a little bit of honey. Okay? Um, people see him and they're like, whoa. You know, you know what Saul just did? The king just told us not to do this. And uh, so Jonathan said, you know, I didn't know that. I don't, why is he doing that? Um, let's go to verse number, um, verse number 29. Of uh, chapter number 14. He says, then, John, then said Jonathan, my father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you, how mine eyes have been enlightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much the more if happily the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemy which they found. For had there not been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? Okay, so, so he's basically saying, you know, they should have been, been allowed to do this. This was not a wise decision by, by Saul. And then what the people do is they go in and they plunder the, the Philistine. They eat their food. They eat it what they're not supposed to. It even mentions the fact that they the people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen. They're starving. They, you know, they hadn't eaten in a long time. And you know, I think personally that Saul, you know, let me re keep reading. And I'll go back to this. But they took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground. And the people did eat them with blood, which you know is against the law to do that. Okay. And, and going back to what I was saying is I, I'm a, pretty sure Saul was responsible for that. Okay, because he told him don't eat anything. Okay, and they're so hungry that he, he um, enabled this to happen, enabled this sin to happen as they go in and commit this sin of eating or break the law of eating um, with blood. And then Saul said, Behold, the people sin against the Lord, and then they eat with blood. And he said, You have transgressed, roll a great stone to me this day. So now they're trying to figure out what they did, and um, Saul's going to blame the people now, again, putting that blame off on somebody else. They're the ones that did it. You know, he's the one that created this this oath or this uh, curse that they were not to eat anything, and then the people commit the sin. So again, this leadership, um, this obedience from Saul is not there, and it actually is leading more people into, into sin because of the lack of leadership and his bad decisions that he made. Okay, So then they try to figure out, we're going to skip on ahead a little bit more into the chapter um, so we can finish up um, with, uh, with this lesson. See if there's anything I, I missed. Okay, so Saul basically says, okay, you all messed up. Let's offer up some sacrifices. It's you all's fault. You know, I'm going to I'm gonna build an altar to the Lord. We're going to sacrifice. Uh, let's go to verse number 37. Verse number 37 of chapter 14. And Saul asked counsel of God, shall I go down to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he answered him not that day. Why didn't God answer? What's that? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Disobedience. Okay, so he basically, you know, then he says, in Saul's eyes, again, puts it off on other people. It's not me. I didn't mess up. It's them. They're the ones that sinned against God. They're the ones that ate of the, the raw meat. 
and the blood. They were the ones that didn't do what they were supposed to, ate the honey when they weren't supposed to. They're, it's their fault. Okay, it's not me. Okay, again, self-centeredness, not looking to the Lord, not looking to what he's supposed to. So then he's blaming it on the people. So they end up finding out, um, he finds out that it's Jonathan was the one. Uh, let's go to verse number uh, 38. And Saul said, draw you near hither, all the chief of the people, and know, and see wherein this sin hath been this day. So let's say, let's, let's see if we can figure it out. Figure out who this was. We're, we're going to cast lots and figure out it's the way that they would um, try to figure out where the sin, and, you know, there's a lot of a lot of mention of casting lots within the Bible, and I don't necessarily know how it works, and somebody does, and I'd like to know, but um, they would basically ask the Lord, you know, basically, who is it? Who's the one here? And the Lord would, would provide that. Um, For as the Lord liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall, sure, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people that answered him. Um, so let's just, then we go down. So then it, um, Jonathan finally admits to him. He said, yeah, it was me. He said, I, I did but taste a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand, and lo, I must die. And Jonathan basically saying, okay, if it's me, if it's one, if I'm the one that's causing this, I'm going to die. Okay, I die. Uh, and Saul said in verse number 44, and, God, and Saul answered him, God, do so and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. Yeah, it's you. You're the one that's doing this stuff to us. And the people then basically say, no. Okay, no, no, no. Don't kill him. Don't do it. Okay. So, so the people rescued Jonathan that he did not die. And so... So if it's not Jonathan, who is it? If, it? if it's not Jonathan causing the Lord not to listen or causing these things to happen, whose fault is it? Um, so they go in. There's still more fighting. Um, verse number 47. So Saul took the kingdom over Israel and fought against all enemies on every side, against Moab and against the children of Ammon and Eden and against the kings of Zobah and against the Philistines. And he's fighting the Amalekites. And so he's got a lot of battles going on um, externally, militarily. He's got a lot of battles going on um, also within his own group of people. Uh, so verse number 52 is what I was talking about earlier, dealing with Saul. It says, and there was a sore war against the Philistines. So there's terrible war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him unto him. Okay. Y'all remember what Samuel said early in this chapter about what he remember he told the children of Israel, he said, if you want a king, what's going to happen? Y'all remember? Well, let's look. It's, good, it's, a, it's a good thing that you asked that. Um, you don't have to turn here, but I'll read it to you. Uh, chapter 8 and verse number 11. Okay. Remember, Samuel was a prophet. Okay. Things that he said, they, came, they, they took place. Okay. They happened. So Samuel, so in verse number 11, remember, this is going back. Remember, the people wanted a king. They're like, we need a king. We want to be like everybody else. They rejected the Lord. They re rejected Samuel, but then they really rejected the Lord. So Samuel said, okay, if you want a king, it's what he said in verse 11. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself and for his chariots and for his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. Okay, and he continues on with stuff that's going to happen. But that's exactly what happened back here next to the end of chapter 14. That's what Saul did. There was so much fighting and so much war. So the, people, the children of Israel are now, you know, they're, they're getting this um, judgment for what they, what they wanted. Exactly what they wanted. Um, so they basically drafted every man that was. It says when Saul saw any young strong man or any valiant man, he took him under him. Okay? So they're getting exactly what they asked for. They rejected God. So let's finish up here at the end, chapter number fifteen. Again, more disobedience. So God gives Saul a chance here. Okay. It says Saul and Samuel said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over the people. We're in chapter fifteen. And now, therefore, hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. So this is this goes way back uh, several hundred years, and the Lord talked about how he wouldn't forget what, the, uh, what Amalek did to the children of Israel. He says, Now go, and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, both, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep and camel and ass. Let me ask you this real quick. Y'all think Samuel did all of the above? Or not Samuel, sorry, Saul. You think Saul did all that he was asked of the Lord? No. If we had a checklist, did he, did he cover most of them? Well, let's see. Again, is most of them okay? Is partial obedience okay? Let's look. So what, here's what Saul did. Saul said, okay, I can do that. Sure. 
So he gathered 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men from Judah. So he got 210,000 men. Um, let's see if we can go down. We can find it. And he came to the city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And let's see if I can find my spot now. Now, verse number 8. And he took uh, Agag, the king of Am Am Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. See, he destroyed the people. But what about the king? Does it say in here to take the king alive? No. Nope, it sure doesn't. Okay, but Saul and the people spared Agag. So, okay, there's one. They look at this one person. It's not going to be a big deal in the eyes of Saul. And the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse that they destroy, destroyed utterly. So he takes in the good stuff. Okay. Again, not following through, not, not fully, 100% obedient. He still did what was right in the eyes of man and not what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And that's not going to work. Okay. This is kind of like the last straw for, for the Lord, for Samuel. Uh, verse number 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So he goes in, Samuel tells Saul, this, this is what you did. In verses uh, 13 through 26, uh, really all the way to the end of the chapter, Samuel's rebuking Saul. Here's what you did. This is what you did. Why'd you do this? We told you to do this, but you did this. Why did you do it? And what's Saul do? Make excuses. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to sacrifice him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then he says, well, um, verse number 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I have gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoils of sheep and oxen, and chief of the things which have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And here's what the key verse uh, for today's lesson. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He's basically saying, Do you think God likes those burnt offerings more than he likes you actually obeying him? No. Uh, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of the rams. So, you know, he's saying, yeah, You did all this stuff in the eye, and when you're, what you say was for the Lord, but the Lord would have been perfectly happy if you just would have listened to him. If you just would have obeyed his commandments and not tried to do your own thing instead of what he wanted you to do. So the rebellion in verse number 23, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is in iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. Okay. So, so God now, God has rejected Saul. Okay. He is no longer the choice for, for being king. And Saul basically shows himself that he's repenting, and he uh, he says, "I'll turn and, and don't don't forget about me." And so you know he's ashamed for what he's done. Um, is he really planning on repenting? Is his heart really turned to the Lord? Uh, more likely not. So then he says, well, Samuel says, "Okay, well I'm going to finish the job. Go get the king." And he kills him. He chops him up into pieces. I thought that was a uh, pretty detailed there. <laughs> That's what they said happened. Uh, so he takes care. He's got to finish what the Lord wanted him to do. Now, all those sheep and all that stuff, there's uh, nothing he can do about that. So as we get to the end, we're going to get to the next time. Uh, the Lord's going to say, we've got to find somebody else now. And Saul's going to obviously not be happy with this decision. And we're going to see that continue on throughout the rest. And we're going to see this, this uh, lack of following the Lord is going to increase. That the following of self is going to increase even more. That jealousy that Saul's going to have is going to increase even more. Um, so the last couple of things, um, obviously we, we know that there's uh, there's a lot of lessons in the Bible about obedience. Um, in, the, in the New Testament especially, um, Jesus said, uh, you rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So that's again talking about obedience. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And there's dozens of these, hundreds of these within the Bible about keeping the commandments of the Lord, being obedient. Um, and finally about Saul, a couple things that uh, I noticed, the fact that he had... He didn't, have, he didn't have faith in God. He had faith in himself. He had faith in his will and what he wanted to get done. Um, he had partial obedience, but he should have had complete obedience. And that's the same, same thing with us. And, and I think we're all guilty of that. I know I am um, as far as, um, you know, there may be times where you're obedient, but then there are times where it's like, mm, I don't know if I really want to do that. Okay. And we see how, how the Lord feels about that. Um, Saul feared man. That's what he said. I feel the people. The people wanted me to do it. 
Now, he should have feared God. He should have feared sure. um, who, you know, who's really in control. Um, Saul trusted in his earthly strength when he should have trusted in God's power. Remember, he had a huge army, and his son only had him and another person, and they were a lot more successful because they trusted the Lord. Uh, he did not have an he, did, he had an insincere faith, and he didn't have a heart of God, a heart for God. And we're going to see that change with leadership um, in in Israel. And the next the next lesson, and I'll tell you what the next chapters to read. Uh, next week will be 1 Samuel 16 through 20. And this is when um, Samuel starts to seek out David, uh, the child of Jesse. So 1 Samuel 16 through 20, and the, the key verse or the memory verse is 1 Samuel 16, verse number 7. 1 Samuel 16, verse number 7. Okay. So if anything I learned from this lesson is the fact that um, the partial obedience is not acceptable. Or in the eyes of the Lord, partial obedience is the same as not going in at all. It's completely not going in. So, um, so full obedience is, is the only way to please the Lord. And Saul learned that lesson the hard way. And uh, many, 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 many people always have and continually will do that throughout the history of this world. So anybody got anything you want to add to it or rebuke me? <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> I probably won't be back if I do. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I can handle it. Okay. All right. If you don't mind, uh, Jody, would you mind uh, closing us in prayer, please? Lord, we thank you for the day you give us. Lord, just thank you, God, for the once again opportunity school this morning. Just thank you for the blessing. And just thank you for being able to look into your word and learn from the Lord and help us, God, to take the lessons we learned here and put it into our lives, Lord. And help us to learn from the history, Lord, and learn from what's gone on in the past so that we can avoid the same mistakes in the future. Pray God that you bless our church, bless the rest of the service today. We pray in Jesus' name.